Wegmeyer with the Nutrients for Life Foundation, and I am super happy to have Todd with us today. Todd is a senior director of IT or kind of technology at a large company called Nutrien. And so we're excited to have him here to talk about technology. So when you think about the fertilizer industry, I'm not sure that technology is the first thing that you think of, agronomy certainly, but technology, there's so much going on. And um, so welcome to global our Global Fertilizer Day celebration, Todd. Well, thanks, Harriet. This is pretty exciting for me to be here as well. So Todd, my first question is, tell me about your job. Sure. I handle technology at all of the fertilizer production facilities across Nutrien globally, which is mostly North America and Trinidad. But anywhere where we produce nitrogen, phosphate, or potash, my team is responsible for all of the technology that goes into keeping those plants and mines safely running for operations, and then also thinking about our future and, and uh, looking at how we can use technology to do things like you know, get into uh, tele-remote, semi-autonomous and autonomous mining uh, half a mile underground at our potash facilities or, you know, using big data sets to understand how we could optimize energy consumption at our at our plants to not only help with sustainability in the environment, but also obviously help to, to produce our fertilizers at the lowest possible cost for our farming customers. So, Todd, I just came up with a whole bunch of questions in my mind, um, and I'm sure many of our students uh, listening in today have questions, too. But the big one that popped up was autonomous mining. Mm -hmm. So I'm having a hard time thinking about how you can do that from an office location. Right. Tell me. Right. So if you, if you think of how potash is produced, so, you know, we send folks uh, half a mile underground and then 15 miles out to the active mining face where they're cutting raw ore out of the ground and then sending it up to surface. You know, our, our job is as a potash business unit is to think about how we can run our operations as safely as possible. And sometimes safety means just removing people from areas of exposure. And so our active mining faces are, are one of those places where safety is a big concern to us. And so the, the idea is, what if in the future we didn't need to send people down there to mine potash? What if the, the potash machines could be run safely from surface or from an office location someday, although that's way out there, or even, you know, taking human interaction out of the equation and having these giant mining machines run themselves underground and, and all we literally do is flip a switch and turn them on and off. So that's the dream. And in order to get there, we have to start thinking about applying technologies very similar to what's going on with uh, the autonomous car industry. So all of the sensors and technology and uh, computer-based technology, vision-based technology, optical recognition, all these things that we can apply to our mining machines so that we can have them essentially run themselves someday. So is this kind of like a big video game? It's starting as a big video game, for sure. So, you know, the idea of uh, starting small and, and slowly working our way through the process to make sure that we're not adding additional safety risks as we go along. So starting with what we call tele-remote operations or running the potash mining machines from somewhere other than right on the machine, which could be, you know, to start with our initial trials were 50 feet away and then, you know, you could do it from a few hundred feet away and eventually maybe even from surface. Uh, and then from there, it doesn't really matter where you are as long as you've got connectivity to the machine, an operator could run it from anywhere. While we're doing that, though, we're also looking at a lot of the sensor and technology based solutions that would uh, take some of the decision making out of the operator's hands and having the machine essentially decide for itself what to do with the intent that eventually if we did more and more and more of that someday, maybe we don't need operators and the machines can run themselves and and we would, you know, focus more on uh, employment in the technology space at our mining mines. And then obviously we still have to have maintenance folks to help keep all that equipment running. But the goal would be someday ideally to take the operator out of the seat and then maybe even off the machine completely and just have the machines do this themselves. So I have to ask, do you, so you said you've kind of started testing this at like the on ground level, like with a person not far from the mining machine? Correct. I, I want to be honest, this started with, you know, we're, we're a supporter and a helper to our operations folks. Our operations folks have been working on this for a few years and we've just in the last number of years started to work together so that we can inject some of these new technologies into it. But as of right now, we have the ability to a few of our mind sites to run our machines away from the machine itself. Yeah. That's just crazy. So 
My next question I want to ask you, Todd, is are you or were you growing up a gamer? If you're into technology or is gaming and sort of just having access to technology, is that just part of your life? You know, I'm going to date myself because I was more of like an Atari 2600 kid than uh, gaming as it is today. It's, it's fascinating to me to see where the gaming industry has gone. Certainly that is a lot of the technology that we're putting into potash mining, that, that is almost what it seems like. We're building, you know, full 3D models of, of underground, um, not just the mining machine itself, but all the equipment behind the mining machine so we can give the operators when they're not on the machine sort of con contextual or situational awareness. So, so three-dimensional view of what's going on right around everywhere where they're mining. And to me, that, that just screams video game development, essentially, but in a completely different setting, which is you know, the mining space, but essentially the ag space as well, because the intent here is to safely produce potash so that we can get it in the hands of our farmer customers so they can grow food to feed the world. Fantastic. So what was your career path to the job that you currently have? Very diverse, I would say. I got out of high school and I had taken a little bit of computer programming and I was interested in it, but I really thought I was going to take more of a business route. So I applied for a two-year diploma program at a polytechnic institution here in Saskatchewan. And the first year was very diverse. It was economics, finance, stats, and one computer programming class. And I finished that and decided I was going to go back and try my hand at university and, and really went a completely different direction. So I, I majored in history with a minor in English for a few years, and then finally decided that that was, uh, you know, a bit of a passion of mine and I really enjoyed it, but wasn't, it wasn't going to be something that was going to get me a, a career that I thought I would be, you know, passionate about or interested in. And I kept coming back to this, you know, the one class that I always enjoyed was the computer programming class. And so I went back to the Polytechnic, finished my two year diploma in uh, computer information systems. So it was a bit of a business focus with a lot of computer focus. That was the way that program was established or, or built. And uh, it was a perfect blend of, for me because it was always about learning how to apply technology, but in the sense of how to use it to solve business problems. And so having a bit of a business background in the program was really um, important for me and, and, and just sort of set me up to keep going from there. So how long have you been with Nutrien? Uh, I started with Nutrien just over five years ago. Yep. And I started in the potash business unit and then as part of the merger that happened to create Nutrien, which is a much bigger, uh, more global company, I was promoted to senior director and, and took over nitrogen and phosphate as well. So did you see yourself ending up in the working in the fertilizer industry? No, this is a big surprise to me. I mean, growing up in Saskatchewan, potash is a huge part of the economy here. Um, through my whole life, I've known about the potash industry in Saskatchewan. And, and it's always been fascinating to me that as big of a, uh, as an ag province as we are, we are a big farmer community here. My family came from the farm. Potash has always been a big part of the province as well. And underground mining is part of that. It's always been fascinating to me that we're, you know, we're farming the surface and then half a mile underground where we're pulling fertilizer out and, and getting it ready for world the world to use to grow food. It's just amazing. So I didn't expect that I would end up in this industry, but I always tell everybody that this is by far the coolest job I've ever had in my career. Um, getting to apply technology to something like a giant underground mining machine is just super fascinating for me and completely different than what I've done elsewhere in my career. And I can't imagine doing anything else. So it sounds like there is a whole bunch you love about your job. What do you think is most challenging about your job? Well, that's a great question. The most challenging thing about my job you know, I think it's, it's a challenge and an opportunity. I think the mining industry is so different that the only way to really be successful at it, I think, is to be shoulder to shoulder with the operations folks. So I, you know, even though my home base is a is an office in Saskatoon, I spend a lot of time out at the potash mines because I think the more I can learn about the business of potash mining, the more I can come up with ideas to help them solve problems through the use of technology. But I think in general, the biggest challenge is just making sure that I'm constantly learning enough about the business to be able to, to, to use that experience to work with operations to apply technology to solve their problems. I love that, Todd. And one thing that came to my mind is you're talking about being working in the information technology, the technology side of things, but you're not just tied to your desk. You are out, you are active problem solving. So I think for all of our students, you know, just thinking about there's there's different forms of technology work that you can go into and what 
Todd has just shared with us, I think is to me opens up a little bit of a different vision of what, of what that can mean. Yeah, that's exactly right, Harriet. And I think that's what's been exciting for me throughout my career. So when I started, I did start behind a keyboard. I was building software for business customers and, and doing lots of different things. And, you know, throughout my career, I've gotten an opportunity to learn lots of different businesses. You know, I, I worked in uh, the energy production space or the utility space, and I've worked in land registry space before, lots of different opportunities. But what's always interested me is being able to understand the business. And so in this job, being in ag or in mining, I get a chance to go out into the, those worlds and spend time side by side with those folks trying to understand what it is they do every day so that I can apply the technology back. So, you know, from my perspective, that's what's made this career so fulfilling is it, it can be a lot of different things depending on where your interests lie. Wonderful. So one last question for you, Todd, what advice might you give to students who, you know, maybe are thinking about some sort of tech job in the future? Any advice you have for them? You know, I'd say look at the programs that best suit maybe where your interests lie. Because at the end of the day, I think you want to wake up every day being excited about what you're going to go to work and do that day. From my perspective, I took a program that had a very heavy business slant to it, as well as the technology slant, and that has served me well. There's other folks that I've worked with over the years that sort of went pure computer science type roles through a university or college, and that has served them well because that's where their interests lie. So I think technology is such a broad space that there's lots of programs out there. They each have a little bit of a different aspect to them. And so pick the one that you think is most in tune with your interests and your passions, because I would say the best advice I could give anybody is when you get out of college or, or a polytechnic or a two-year diploma course, it's just, you know, come out with something in mind in terms of what gets you passionate about getting up every morning and going to work and then everything else from that becomes easy wonderful todd thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your career path with our students today as we celebrate global fertilizer day thank you for having me Harriet. this is great Good morning, Todd. How are you today? I'm doing well, Carl. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Good. I can hear you fine. Our uh, our technology seems to be back live and working. It's what happens when you get a tech guy on the actual program. Just for everyone else out there who's who's listening, uh, Corey Rosenbush gives his apologies, but we've had some tech issues and he won't be able to join us today. But we will soldier on in our celebration of Global Ag Day with Global Fertilizer Day without Corey, unfortunately. But um, we have got Todd here today. And I love that video, Todd. That was that was fantastic. Very nice job. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Obviously, being in front of a camera like that, being recorded just like now is a little bit odd for me. But uh, I had a lot of fun with Harriet. It was, it was a good time and uh, always excited to talk about some of the technology stuff we're doing here. So thanks for having me. Well, we're glad you're here. We, uh, we are starting to get some questions coming in for, uh, for our teachers and our classrooms who are out there. The, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, send those questions in. We're gonna have a conversation here with Todd and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer some of those. And, and if, we, if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll get to yours. But uh, here's the thing that I, that I was struck by, Todd. When somebody's in high school, aren't they supposed to know what they wanna do with the rest of their life? You, uh, you certainly had a circuitous path to get where you are today. Is, what happened? Why, why didn't you have it mapped out? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I think I enjoyed so many different things in high school. I mean, the, my biggest passion through grade 11 and grade 12 was actually, um, I had an exceptional drafting instructor. And so I did a, a ton of drafting. I took spares and then use that time while I was in school to go, you know, do a grade 12 project where we got to design our own, our own house, not just the floor plans, but the engineered drawings and everything from the ground up. And I don't know, I just, I've always had lots of diverse interests. And so uh, for some reason, I came out of high school thinking, you know, general business was the way I wanted to go. And that's why I started in the diploma program. And, you know, thankfully, that first year was quite well rounded. And so I got a chance to try my hand at a bunch of different things. And that computer programming class was just the one that stuck. For me, it was, um, it seemed like a great mix of, you know, business focus, trying to solve problems, but it's a very creative space. You know, you, you can do a lot of really creative things in, in, uh, in technology and computer programming. And I think that's what stuck with me. And that's why I finally ended up back there, you know, a number of years later to, to finish off and fast forward and 
I don't want to admit it, but 25 years later, and you know, here we are. So, yeah. Now, here's a here's an interesting question that came in. Are you an IT guy or are you a fertilizer guy? Great question. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm, uh, I'd like to think I'm both because I think to be as successful uh, as possible in this um, space of technology, you kind of have to know what you're solving for. And so if you're a video game developer, you're looking at, you know, how do I solve uh, the problem of coding a video game? And in my world, it was always about how do you solve problems in land registry services, which is, you know, essentially the foundation of our democracy, knowing who owns land um, and, you know, who it belongs to. And then, you know, in the ag space or in the fertilizer space, in the mining space, depending on how you want to look at it, it's about understanding enough about uh, that side of the world to be able to say, hey, you know, there's some technology out there that, you know, uh, I might know about that our folks in operations might not know about that I can help to inject into what they're trying to do. But I can't do that if I if I don't know enough about their business and their business problems to be able to solve it. So if I had to pick one, probably technology, but it's a pretty close, you know, even mix. That's always how I viewed it throughout the years. Now, some of our some of our students uh, have never heard of nutrient. Uh, and they mentioned that uh, that uh, it sounds like you're Canadian. Talk to us a little bit about Nutrient. Sure. I mean, you know, Nutrient was formed a number of years ago through the merger of Agrium and uh, Potash Corp. And so we have this great mix of we've got retail outlets, uh, largest ag retailer in North America, but we've also got these big production assets that produce the nitrogen phosphate and uh, potash that that uh, our farmer customers need to grow the crops they need to feed the world so um, you know we're a, a big sort of uh, through the entire value chain company largest potash producer in the world by volume and one of the largest nitrogen producers in the world by volume um, so we have a great mix of of everything across the whole value chain of of ag right from you know pulling it out of the ground or out of the air from a nitrogen perspective all the way through to uh, you know selling it to our farmer customers so they can uh, put it on their fields and help feed the world. So here's here's another another one of these critical questions. If someone wants to follow in your footsteps, as I said, a circuitous path. But if they want to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them? What how how do they get started? Yeah, you know, if if they know technology is where they want to go, then I think there's tons and tons of programs out there. Um, speaking more broadly around ag, if, if, um, if that's a field they're interested in, then I, I would say, um, you know, our colleges and universities are actually set up quite well to give students an opportunity the first year or two to sort of broaden their horizons and take lots of different classes. And, and I would suggest trying to do that, you know, focusing on where you, where you think your passion is, as your major, but then also use those opportunities to take other classes and things that are completely different that you might have an interest in, because you never know if one of those classes actually uh, you know, sort of triggers some passion inside of you, and you, you do end up going a completely different direction. I don't think everybody does this the way I did it. Uh, I'm not sure I'd even recommend it, but it's uh, it's an interesting way to get to the end game for sure. But um, yeah, and I think um, if, if technology is the way you want to go, but you're also interested in the business side of it of, or focus of it, then I think that's where I would start is, you know, starting with a computer science program, but see if you can round that out with some different business classes, whether that's economics or stats, um, accounting, you know, you, you name it, just sort of round out your education a little bit. So you come out of college or university with, uh, uh, or a, like me, a polytechnic or a diploma program with a little bit more than just the, the, the key aspects of, of your major. Let's talk a little bit about fertilizer. And uh, I, think, I think some of our, our, our listeners would be interested and surprised to learn that a lot of fertilizer is mined out of the ground. You talked about that a little bit with Harriet. Can you talk a little bit more about, about, uh, about where fertilizer comes from? Sure. I mean, um, well, let's start with, we'll do all three if we have time, Carl. I don't know. If we yeah, we got time. Go. You know, just very basically, you can read up on nitrogen and understand how it's made, but essentially it's pulled out of the air. You know, these giant furnaces, you inject air into it, you split the molecules and you do a bunch of processing and out the other end um, comes refined nitrogen in, in various forms that are used for different things. Uh, our two open pit phosphate operations down in the southern United States, uh, it, it's basically either on the surface or just under the surface. And so in, in one location, we essentially just start digging it right off of the surface and sending it out to be refined and milled into phosphate products. 
Uh, and in, in our other location, uh, there's a, a certain layer of uh, earth and dirt that, that sits between us and the phosphate that we need to get to. So we have to sort of scrape off that overburden and get to the phosphate stuff. Um, with these, you know, giant drag lines that are the size of a two-car garage that actually move around. So I always think of, uh, for anyone who's ever watched Star Wars and the ADAT vehicles that they have, it's, they're these giant things that have feet on them that move around. And essentially their, their job is to dig out dirt and dig out the phosphate raw products so that it can be uh, sent off to the mill for refinement. And then potash takes various forms in terms of how it's produced. But for us, the vast majority of our potash is found half a mile underground. Um, and so, you know, we have cages or we send workers down big elevators that go half a mile underground and they hop into a, a Jeep or a transport vehicle and drive up to 15 miles out to the active mining face where they you know, historically hopped on these big machines that are 16 feet wide by eight feet tall, varying sizes, of course, but, um, and they, they push that mining machine into raw ore and out comes the, the stuff off the back. And there's a series of belt lines that bring it to these giant skips that hoist it up to surface mm -hmm. into a mill for refinement. So it's, it's basically a giant underground mining operation. Um, and from that comes the three ingredients that, that help to um, ensure we can feed the planet that our farmers have got the inputs they need to help feed the planet. So it's neat stuff. And, and you're trying to figure out how to mine some of this autonomously. Correct. With robots, basically, right? Yeah. yeah. We're taking our existing mining machines and retrofitting them with the same types of sensors and technology and equipment you'd find in autonomous cars so that we can first start by helping our operators that, that drive those things today and make it possible for them to drive it from somewhere, you know, behind the machine or on surface, which we're, you know, we're able to do today in, in a few of our minds. And then eventually take some of those decisions um, through technology, let the machine decide for itself how to mine properly and, and appropriately, uh, and then remove people from harm's way. And, you know, I think there's tons of opportunities to help augment our workforce in different ways, but get them away from, from those locations where it's not as safe as, you know, like, Wow, that's fascinating stuff, Todd. I could uh, I could sit and chat with you uh, all morning long, but uh, the people who are keeping the time would would tell me that I need to move on. What you've done this morning, though, and I appreciate and I thank you for, is that you've made IT incredibly interesting. IT in the fertilizer space, incredibly interesting. And we we thank you for you. We uh, we wish you the best of luck, and thanks again for coming on today. Well, thanks for having me, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, guys.